You're here in the developer toolkit track sponsored by agora.io and we've got a a, a great uh, a panel here um, to, to round the day off i've uh, seen so many things this afternoon that have made me think in all sorts of different directions we've covered a lot of different topics and this one's no different this is uh this is called machine takeover we've got a panel here about improving your game with machine learning and ai and um my colleague matthew ford uh from pocketgamer.biz is going to moderate this panel um do we have uh, Matthew in the house? Let's see if we can bring it. There we go. Fantastic. And Matthew's going to be joined by um, uh, Tommy Thompson uh, from AIM Games and Kelly Vero from So Real. I think Jeff Shee was on the, um, on the, on the docket from Unity, but I'm not sure whether, whether he's with us. Uh, if, uh, if, yeah. uh, if, if Jeff Church shows up, we'll, we'll invite him. But if not, so uh, Matthew, how are you doing? Not bad yourself? Yeah, I'm all right. Thank you. Yeah, good. I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to hand over to you folks uh, watching. If you have questions for uh, Matthew's panel, Pop them in the Q&A box at the bottom there and, um, uh, and Matthew can take them or I can join you later on and help out. But Matthew, over to you and to, to introduce your panel. Thank you. So uh, yes, as uh, Dave was saying, uh, my name is Matthew Ford. I'm the staff writer for pocketgamer.biz. Um, I'm going to be your host for today's session. So we're talking about, uh, or even panel. Uh, so we're talking about machine takeover and improving your game with machine learning AI. Uh, and I'm joined by a esteemed panel of guests here, much more well informed than myself uh, so we'll start off uh, just telling me about yourself and um, what you do and your connection to machine learning so if we start off with you Kelly. Uh, I'm Kelly Vero I am the current head of game development at So Real Digital Twins based in Bern Switzerland. I've been working in the games industry for 25 years I don't think I'm a veteran <laughs> but, um, I'm, I'm not old enough to be a veteran but uh, I, I'm the person really that's responsible for doing all of the kind of dirty work underneath the hood when building uh, our assets for game development, VR, XR, you name it, fashion tech, everything we do. So any questions you've got about anything machine learning in that automation platform, please hit me. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually tuned into your talk earlier, Kelly. That was uh, very interesting as well. Obviously it was on the same subject. Yeah, yeah, interesting, interesting, <laughs> Matthew. You're still awake, so it must have been okay. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Tommy, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hello everybody. Um, I'm Tommy Thompson. Uh, I work as a senior lecturer in computer science uh, with a particular specialism in um, artificial intelligence applied to video games. Uh, however, for the last couple of years, I have ran AI and Games, an obligatory uh, company swag on today, um, where I work as a consultant um, and a developer uh, working with companies big and small about how to utilize AI in different ways and actually just help bootstrap them, um, particularly if they're really interested in working with AI in a video game and they don't really know how. Now, most people actually know me as a YouTuber um, because AI and Games, the company spun out of my YouTube channel. Uh, if you actually just look up AI and Games on YouTube, you'll find it pretty quickly, where I give a lot of videos where I crack open the hood of famous games and tell you how they work, as well as look at weird and often very exciting academic research in game AI that you would never hear about otherwise. Good stuff. Uh, so I want to start off um, by asking you both, what does the term machine learning mean to you? So um, I've actually found a quite a good description online. Um, so I just want to read this through, obviously give a bit of a quick, nice little overview and everything like that and see what you think of it as well, get your thoughts. So machine learning is the ability for a system to learn and improve from experience without being explicitly programmed. Machine learning is also more commonly known as AI and as a subset of technologies that make up artificial intelligence. So Kelly, do you want to start off? I mean, I prepared like an answer to this question that was uh, from that incredible film from the 1980s, Top Gun, which was, I feel the need, the need for speed. <laughs> because what machine learning does in my line of work is, is speed things up dramatically. So we're talking from things happening over three hours or a week to going right down to minutes, in some cases, even seconds. So what machine learning means to me is all of those things you just said, but that I can get my clients into the place that they need to be in much faster. Tommy? Yeah, um, I think, uh, actually, I'm gonna, I'll get to the, essentially what Kelly said right at the end, because that kind of really helps summarize my perspective on it, but it's really about extrapolating relationships and in, in established data. And when you have a very large amount of data, whether it's a very complex video game environment, maybe it's data that you're actually getting from players, it might be 
uh, data you're gathering from other systems, trying to extrapolate relationships within that is often very difficult. Machine learning is really great at being able to recognize patterns within that behavior within that data set and then actually even tell you that those patterns exist because you didn't know it beforehand looking at it because it was 10 million records of 50 fields of data in each case. Um, or uh, it's able to allow you to then use that data to predict potential future outcomes. And one of the big things that differentiates machine learning from classical or symbolic AI, as you would typically consider it, is that traditionally in old fashioned AI, you would build an annotation of how you would expect a, a system to solve a problem. Um, and then it kind of, it searches for a solution by pretending to th um, think like a human does. Uh, whereas machine learning doesn't do that. You give it the data, you give it the framework within which that you want it to learn. And then we're relying on this idea that machine learning is going to learn kind of like a human does. And hopefully the thing that it learns at the end is actually useful to us if we've done our job right. Doesn't always work, but you know, um, sometimes that doesn't always pan out. But yeah, one of the critical parts is, as said there, it's all about speed. Because once you have trained that machine learning system, the inference at runtime is incredibly fast versus a more traditional system where it's still having to search for the solution every time you give it the problem it needs to solve. That sounds good to me. So um, I'm gonna come back to you, Tommy, straight away. So what do you think are the okay. best examples and uses of machine learning in games so far? Uh, I get hit this one a lot. This is always a difficult one to answer. Um, actually, one of my, uh, two of my favorites, um, only one of them is player facing and the other one is actually an art pipeline, um, which I think is really relevant. So first of all, I think the Drivatar and Forza series is a really great example of this. Mm. Um, that is one of the longest running and established tools that's been in AAA games certainly for years, uh, where the Drivatars, the idea is that you have a digital avatar that replaces another human player. Um, and all the AI racers in the, in the Forza series since Forza 5 onwards, I believe, are now these Drivatars. And that is a Bayesian learning system. So it is using Bayesian learning to train an artificial neural network, which then calculates the expected utility of a player's ability to drive around a racetrack. Um, even if the player has never raced in that car or never raced on that racetrack before. It's a really awesome um, application that, uh, we now just expect, and it's only now rolling out into other racing games. Um, MotoGP, for example, is doing very something kind of similar but different. Um, more recently, I've been really excited by the application in animation. Um, there's a huge amount of work, uh, notably from Ubisoft at present, uh, looking at how to build real-time animation controllers um, through use of machine learning. So to streamline the process for animators, they're, they're building, they build the best animations they possibly can. They don't have to worry about building these really complex animation controllers to make sure the character turns and moves smoothly. So. Um, for example, For Honor, uh, that game that was one of the first ones that they really used to pioneer this. Uh, more recently, um, Assassin's Creed Odyssey is actually one of the first games that's using new voice, uh, voice lip syncing tech that was developed through um, one of Ubisoft's R&D units. And that's allowing them to speed up the process of actually getting the lips to sync up when the character is speaking. Um, it's now actually learning off that data and doing it and, and executing that in real time. And it looks fantastic. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool, actually. Um, I don't know if you've heard of um, EA had a program called Seed, I believe, that imitates yes. professional players, which I, I yeah. always thought was quite a different and cool initiative, yeah. that's. I think that's got a really interesting application in the coming years. One of the big problems that comes with it, uh, or you know, certainly challenges, is finding the data. Um, a lot of people are looking right now to um, what well, certainly clients I speak to, where they look at Alpha Star, which was Google DeepMind's StarCraft II player. And they say, oh my God, we want to have this. How can we reproduce that? I said, well, one of the things that benefits um, Alpha Star is the ecosystem that StarCraft II exists within. It's a very big game. It's got a very popular esports uh, environment. Um, it's been around for years. And so one of the first things that Alpha Star does or DeepMind did during the training of that system is they use supervised learning to bootstrap that system against established human players. And then it uses uh, self-play reinforcement learning to get better and exceed human play. So the first thing they do is they rely on a, a lot of this existing professional um, gameplay replay data and they use that to train it. And they say, okay, go and watch these replays, get good, and then we're going to improve you from there. And so particularly looking at stuff that Seed is doing is really exciting. But one of the things we need there is that data. You actually need all that play data um, to then extrapolate from that like really good play patterns. 
Yeah. Conversely, if I can just chip in, I would say that like, and more controversially, actually speaking from um, somebody that's worked like heavily in MMOs, one of the things that I really, really love is the kind of safe breaker approach. So anything that gold farmers have ever done, <laughs> <laughs> It'd be kind of really interesting for us to really understand and get under the skin of exactly what it is that we need to do in a very short space of time. Obviously, as I said before in the previous conversation, everything that we do is built on speed. But we can learn a great deal from what humans are doing. And I think I said kind of earlier in my earlier track, you know, algorithms are all about asking questions. So, you know, being able to ask a series of questions that comes from a kind of human perspective without, you know, um, too much negating what it is that you said, Tommy. Um, it's important that in order for us to get into those places in MMO, we have to ask those kind of human questions. What better place to go to than the burglars, you know, to ask them how to build the perfect safe. So, um, yeah, I mean, I like the way that some stuff has developed over the past uh, sort of four or five, maybe 10 years from back in the day when I was working on RuneScape up until present day. And I think my favorite, uh, uh, machine learning and uh, AI especially has been in Forza so you stole the words out of my mouth sorry also, sorry no not at all. <laughs> also the, the camera stuff that we did in uh, I said earlier on Transformers Universe was absolutely spectacular oh, yeah. the team that worked on that worked on amazing vehicle transformation using pure AI it was totally mathematical completely outside of everybody's understanding and it worked like a dream first time yeah, as I, I imagine, um, you've seen Jeff has appeared in the bottom of our corner. How are you doing, Jeff? Hi, how are you, Matt? I yeah, sincerely not bad. Not bad, apologize. Thank you. I had this uh, on the wrong date, so I, I, <laughs> I know I've missed some great conversation about this topic, so I sincerely um, apologize. We're just today. getting going, don't worry about it. No. Uh, do you want to do a quick introduction yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my name is Jeff. I'm with Unity Technologies. I lead our, our product teams and AI, um, focusing on like machine learning agents, uh, you know, using deep learning, uh, neural networks and games for uh, various uh, uh, use cases and such. So I'm uh, very happy to be here with, uh, with you and the uh, fellow panelists. Yeah, great to have you. Um, I mean, just the question we were just asking then, um, what are the best examples and uses of machine learning in games so far? Do you have anything to add to that? Oh, there's uh, a lot, a lot of good, good stuff. I think you know everything from like um, obviously like from like you know user acquisition all the way to the experience in the game. Um, yeah, I think that for me the one I really love to see is the the use of like deep learning for like behaviors. It obviously touches a lot in the area that we work in. Um, you know, one of the challenges we always see is like if you want to create really, really compelling experiences. You know, what happens today? There's a lot of you know, iterative development uses a lot of state machines, a lot of like, um, you know, sort of the classical AI. Uh, we're starting to see, you know, games that are saying, okay, well, I want to create a very dynamic behavior. Like how the game reacts to the way I play it will be very much different from the way you, you, you play it. Um, so we're starting to see some studios that are using, you know, reinforcement learning to drive these kind of behaviors. Uh, so that to me is like really exciting in part. I think, you know, the next generation of games, not only will it be on like, you know, PS5 with these like amazing graphics and consoles. I mean, in real fives demos were amazing, but also just the experience, um, I think are gonna be very dynamic and you're starting to see this like sort of intersection of you know, machine learning and AI with, with gaming. Yeah, what, what about the likes of when it comes to competitive play? You know, I know Tommy, you mentioned esports and everything like that. Um, the likes of NPCs being more formidable and, uh, you know, reading players movements. Yeah. Um, you know, you obviously, yeah, you see like the StarCraft examples, which are awesome, right? Like, um, and you see like, uh, you know, the, these machines and from a research perspective, trying to create new, new algorithms and approaches to beat, you know, some games like StarCraft. Um, the, the one I see that's kind of interesting is actually not so much as like humans competing against machines in like an arena setting. I, I think, you know, at some point, like, you know, obviously like the machine has a lot of advantages. It can play, you know, countless years of games, you know, in the matter of minutes. Uh, what's interesting in the esports side is actually more like using you know NPCs and AI for training. So if you're a top, um, let's say you're a top Fortnite player, or you're a top, you know, you know, uh, you know like any game, uh, you're using the AI actually for training purposes. I think that's where you'll see a lot of um, you know, probably the adoption for. I mean, you're starting to see that now with some of the top esports player. They're you know looking into ways they can have you know in their own personal training better you know better training. Um, 
Yeah, and then when they go into like play, you know, human versus human competitions, uh, you know, they have a, an advantage. Um, but I think the notion of like humans trying to beat machines, I think it's inherently disadvantage to a human because, you know, machines can play, you know, like the training for StarCraft was like something in like the hundreds of years of training range, right? So, um, you know, obviously like, you know, we can't, we can't simulate that in our own you know, real world and stuff. So, um, but that's kind of my, my, at least what I've seen and like how this is stuff to apply to these sports. Yeah. Um, so how important um, are humans when it comes to looking after the technology? You know, are they a must to stop AI from doing something unexpected? Um, I'll come to you first, Kelly, this time. Um, I think, you know, <laughs> A good head of development surrounds themselves with experts. I think that's just really important. Um, we're kind of really lucky that, you know, I, I think in previous games that I've worked on, it's been really difficult because there's always this fear when you're making like a AAA game, that you're making a AAA game that's for the designer or you're making it for the developer when actually if you surround yourself with people that are outside, that are living outside of the box, you, you're making a better game. So on, on the digital twin side for us, we're working with, you know, guys who've got doctorates, PhD, like students and uh, masters that are kind of total, you know, sensors in terms of what it is that they want to achieve with machine learning. On the game side on the game development side my experience has always been that it can be a little bit uh problematic maybe sometimes to bring in the human aspect that you know there's a couple of games that you guys have already mentioned that are really incredible and that sort of paving the way and driving a train through how humans and computers are interacting perfectly and that's eve online and starcraft these two games like particularly are doing incredible things in terms of machine learning, but they're also using the human element to be able to bring that stuff to life and on board. And I think that's really relevant to the conversation that we're having like right now. I don't really think that many people have thought about it a great deal, but even StarCraft definitely have. And you didn't mention, Jeffrey, I'm really annoyed that you didn't mention Mars because Mars is absolutely amazing as well. And so the ability of what Mars can do is just, mind-blowing you know it's Carl Sagan type stuff. Jeffrey would you like to follow up to that? You mean Mars like the Unity Mars uh the ARC oh yeah absolutely um you know because now you have a world where you can simulate you know anything right and you know it's the you know we always talk about like behaviors of game starcraft everything's in the virtual world but when you have something like Mars um you know and you, you apply these things like you know like the, the concept of procedurally generated content with something like Mars, with something like, you know, like a living room or, uh, you know, or like a patio. And now you have a world where you can actually train any kind of model to do any kind of detection and using something like Mars, right? I mean, Mars is still intended to, you know, be a studio for creating AR applications. But then if you extend that to the machine learning side, now all of a sudden, like, you know, you want to have like, you know, an app that can detect anything in the real world. Now you have something like Mars where you can extend. So we're, we're very excited. And we actually have a few studios that are building AR apps on Mars, and then like now engaged us from the AI side and machine learning to do all this stuff. So yeah, uh, you know, it's, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's a very uh, important, you know, topic for us as such. Tell me. I mean, yeah, like I often look at it as the application of an AI, you know, AI particularly a machine learning tool um, in this context it is not there to replace a human. It is there to enhance an existing person's workflow. Um, sometimes maybe a, a business level management might not see it that way, which I think is potentially an issue we might have to deal with in the coming years. Um, but I think that's an incredibly important thing to recognize is that you still require human input. Machine learning is built to optimize a model based on what we originally think it is. We might be wrong. We might need to go back and revise that model because our original I mean, I've made that mistake over the years. Oh, I'm going to train an agent that's going to learn how to solve this problem. And it comes up with the easiest and cheapest solution because I didn't give it enough information about the, the, the problem I was trying to get it to solve. But even um, looking at some of the existing examples, we talked about um, Drivatar, Forza's Drivatar earlier. One of the interesting things about that project is that the designers still have the ability to supersede what the Drivatar system does in that game. And one of the interesting reasons that emerged is because during playtesting and development of that game, they realized that during um, playtesting, 
players don't like to actually play drive avatars that play like humans do because they found that all the drive avatars would t-bone all the other cars and then just smash into them and drive away and people were getting frustrated uh, the cars would take shortcuts and when people said well why is the drive avatar doing this and they said well we trained it on a human and that's what the human does and so there's actually a layer of that system where the designers actually went in and said, okay, if the, if, this, if the car's going to try and cut that corner, we're not going to let it do it. If it's going to smash into that other car, we're not going to let it do it. So there's always a case of building the model that facilitates our problem. And then uh, engineer level and design level coming in and saying, is that really what we want? And then kind of tweaking that accordingly to suit. Yeah, we've actually got an uh, audience question uh, from Dan Gossard asking, um, you mentioned using AI to train professional esports players. Do you see this application being designed for tutorializing players either throughout their gameplay or in specific tutorial sections? Could AI coaches be on the horizon? Why not? You know, I, I don't think anything's out of the, the realms of possibility. I think, um, you know, just, just this feeds out really nicely into what Tommy and Jeffrey were just talking about. Two of my first games, uh, I did um, Tomb Raider and I did uh, MotoGP. And these two games are primed for this, absolutely primed. I mean, you've got the whole training like scene and tutorial scene in, in Laura's mansion. Imagine what could be done instead of just having a butler follow you around with a tray. Um, there's so much more that can be done using, you know, maybe esports tutorials and having that kind of coaching place. So I don't really think that that's out of the realms of possibility from a game development perspective, not at all. Yeah, Sky's I mean, limit, that sounds of it. No, yeah, I, I, absolutely. And the, the always thing to consider is like, there's always like a trade-off, right? Um, because, um, you know, one side of it, like you want to design a tutorial that you want to design a very specific for an experience for a tutorial. And you want like, you know, you as the, you know, the designer or, or, or you know, like the producer, or you want like the experience to be very, very specific. Um, when you give up sort of that control to machine, you know, then there's like a trade-off, right? Like, you know, and there's not only just the cost, like it may just be easier to develop a tutorial, you know, by, you know, iteratively by hand. Um, and there's like a trade-off for using machine learning it takes time. There's like some, you know, setup costs. Um, so it, it's just, you know, to add on to what Kelly mentioned, like, yeah, of course, you know, like you want to like a very, you know, unique kind of tutorial. Maybe you want to be very adaptive. Machine learning is a great for that. Um, and but then again, it's just like it depends on the experience, where you're trading off, development time, experience, control, um, and that's where like this is where this stuff is really fascinating because there's, there's a spectrum of like how you can approach the uh, the problem and such. Yeah. So, uh, what would you say in your all of your experiences? What are the best tools slash middleware for developers who are new to machine learning and uh, know nothing about the tech? Uh, go on, Tommy. You can you can start. Off. I was going to say, I was actually going to start with the Unity ML agents, um, which, uh, you know, given, given our company, <laughs> it's like, well, you know, but I think that's actually a really um, relevant answer to this, um, not just because I'm trying to be buddy here, but because there's a fundamental change in the paradigm. There's a fundamental change in the terms and terminology we're using. And uh, particularly for someone who is used to dealing in symbolic AI, maybe you're writing old fashioned like A star search algorithms, maybe you're using finite state machines, behavior trees, whatever. If you're entrenched in that world and you know that world, transitioning over to machine learning is quite a hurdle. It's an entirely different um, concept to get your head around. And so finding something that is accessible and kind of a, a more critically actually plugged in and ready to go inside an established engine. Um, is critical at this point, I think really to help gain some momentum and really bring more and more developers on board. So yeah, I'd say probably the Unity tools at the moment. <laughs> Jeffrey? Uh, yeah, yeah uh -huh. obviously like I have like, you know, obviously like, you know, some feeding the, you know, like some of the product pieces for ML agents and things like that. Obviously we're very biased and, and you know, we do see a lot of, <laughs> a lot of like game developers for the time. I'll put a different, another kind of tool out there that it's, if you're interested to learn about neural networks, deep learning, reinforcement learning, the open AI, um, Atari, you know, 2800 baselines are really, really good place to start. I mean, it's a lot more, you know, they use what they call like, you know, like, like DQN reinforcement learning. So it teaches you how to like a lot more like a simplified, you know, model of RL and it's on Atari games, which are a little bit more easy to like, you know, I mean, they're in your 2D, a little bit more easier to kind of wrap around. Um, MLH is a really good tool if you want to learn, you know, like 
you know, you know, get a little bit more deeper. You can like, you know, put in your own environment. You can put in your, your games. If you just want to learn about neural networks, TensorFlow, you know, um, you know, like some of like reinforcement learning, how it works, the, the open AI Atari uh, set is really, really good to, to start with. Um, and yeah. I just finished by saying that um, on my side, on the art side, uh, image segmentation and semantics is really important. So I would use something like slicer.org. You can get a really good tool from Slicer and it really just allows you not only because it's open source to be able to sort of contribute to that environment, but also be able to segment your images in the way that you want to segment them. And then that enables you to be able to handle the machine learning at the level that you want to handle the machine learning. It's not something that you can just uh, jump out of the traps and suddenly be an expert in. It's something that you need to take time over. As I said earlier, you have a lot of questions to ask especially of your environment and your objects and the things that you want to do using machine learning. So Slice is a really good place to start because it has a great community platform. Yeah, um, you mentioned Slicer and Unity, obviously. Would you say they're, are they the best or are they best for beginners, would you say? Is, is there one particular... They're the best for everybody because yeah. the budget, the budgetary constraints that a lot of people have when they want to get on the bottom rung. But, you know, Unity tools are always the best tools to be able to open the door to really where, where you want to go. And then Slicer just adds on top of that. Obviously, it's an open source tool. You know, it works alongside other things that you want to do. And it's a, you know, really nice gateway drug into other things that you want to explore and experience. Yeah, and of course you mentioned image segmentation, which was a part of your talk this afternoon, which um, people can catch up and will be on our channels um, in the coming days, I imagine. Um, so what do you expect to be the big drivers for machine learning over the next few years? Uh, I'm gonna to go to Jeffrey for this one first. Yeah, I mean, something that I mentioned earlier around like, you know, just like the behaviors of games. I mean, it's it's not just machine learning, but you're combining like sort of like the, you know, traditional so like planner, you know, approaches with something like machine learning to create really, you know, like different kinds of experiences. Um, in my view, I think more and more games are just they just need to be more adaptive. I think you know, you know, they have one game. You know, they think the traditional model of just like you know, like you, know, you have some adaptiveness, but I think just having like very very customized, you know, very personalized games, uh, even to the, the the into the world where like even the game, you know, the core game loops may change for different kinds of players and behaviors. I think that's and you know, like at least in our view, that's kind of what we we always kind of talk about in our. <laughs> You know, like lunch meetings and like, you know, happy hours, like, you know, really where, where's all stuff, what we do are going to lead to. And I think that's where we, we, we kind of feel like that's the, the end point. Kelly. Well, I'm really enjoying at the moment, Eve discovery. I think, you know, using the human as the machine is a really interesting experience because it is driving a heck of a lot of data towards places that we really need to go to you know, coronavirus and COVID notwithstanding, you know, we have a lot to learn about human behavior and we can only learn that by becoming part of a bigger machine. But on the pure, you know, machine learning side, I would say that I think there is a, um, a great deal of stuff out there. Borderlands, you know, they're exploring a great deal of opportunities using machine learning within their game experience. They're growing their IP cleverly by building a lot of deep learning into what it is that they're doing. So expect to see more stuff on the Halo Destiny side, expect to see stuff on the Borderlands side and more EVE Online, more MMO. Of course, as we go into the new gen as well, there'll be even more experiments, yeah, yeah. I imagine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Tommy, anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, really uh, two, two things, like whatever there's data and whatever there's the opportunity to save money or make it. Um, you know, so we're looking at, I mean, particularly one of the things I don't expect to see is a lot of machine learning applications in the context of non-player characters. That doesn't, and I think there's certain circumstances where that works really well, like the racing examples of Drivatar and uh, MotoGP are great for that. But a lot of the kind of tried and true techniques for building enemy characters, I don't think that's going to change drastically because there's, those are kind of entrenched at this point. I'm interested in where there are open opportunities that we just have real um, development problems or those massive amounts of data. Um, 
Jamie Lamb over in the group chat has pointed out about economy systems, right? Absolutely. Like what data can we get about in-game monetization? Like how are people spending? Can we predict, can we actually improve churn prediction? Can we customize monetization packages based on player uh, interaction and how much money people are spending, which has both significant opportunities, but is also incredibly dangerous, I think, in some regards. Uh, there is, um, particularly on live service games, you know, like um, Kelly was just saying there, you know, Destinies and um, Borderlands and whatever else, like games of that nature. Uh, Esports, um, there's already a huge amount of work that's happening in this space. The Digital Creativity Labs at the University of York has been working with um, Valve as part of the Dota Invitationals, where they're actually providing um, real-time uh, analytics and essentially data that's used as part of commentary. Um, so people are able to play the game and it's sort of the equivalent of watching a sports game, a, a, you know, um, football, soccer, American football, whatever, whatever we are in the world, whatever demographic I'm dealing with. Um, and that, that real time information is coming in. So people are able to see that data as they're playing the game. Maybe it's suggesting, hey, switch hero, you're not working in this point. This lane, you're not working out, change tactic. Um, uh, other, I actually wrote some of these down online toxicity, uh, because there's always plenty of that and we need to minimize it. And thankfully there is actually an increased urgency, I think, to address this, thankfully. Um, uh, optimization of game, game systems such as physics, there's actually some fantastic work that Ubisoft's doing alongside McGill University at the moment. Um, texture upscaling, which is this small crowd movement, or like kind of online hobbyist movement right now. We're seeing a lot of old games getting mods where people are uh, releasing 4K texture packs to run on emulators. Uh, could that actually speed up some of the processes of doing a remaster or re-release of an old game by actually, okay, let's just put it through uh, deep learning and see if we can actually upscale the old, the, the old textures. Yeah, you actually, uh, you mentioned the University of York, interesting. Is that the, in the UK or is that the, um, the American York? Because I'm actually from York. Oh, sorry, so. yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's the one, it's the one in York, actually. Oh, wow. So the University of York is alongside Queen Mary University of London. They are part of the Intelligent Games and Gaming Intelligence Consortium, or IGI, for short, which is like one of the largest doctoral training centers for games research. And it's the biggest one in Britain. It's one of the biggest in the world. And uh, there's a huge amount of kind of game AI related research coming out of those two universities. So if you're interested in that, go and have a look at the, the work that they're churning out. They're doing great stuff. There you go. Learn something new. That's good. Yeah. Go York. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so obviously we mentioned next gen, everything that's obviously uh, upcoming very soon, we've got you know, the PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X, um, iPhone 12, anything like that. Uh, how much of a shift do you expect with the next generation of softwares and consoles? So, uh, Kelly? Massively. Um, th this period, that, I mean, we're sat in a, in a process right now where we're on Pocket Gamer Connects Digital 2. Um, the first version was a response to what was happening in the pandemic situation. And so we've had to find a way to connect with one another over more of a um, virtual situation. And uh, this, this has caused us to make a lot of changes, not only to our life, but also to our pipelines, our workflows, how we do things. So everything has changed for us. Um, I'm not just talking about us as a business, I'm talking about the game development world as a whole. Um, the only thing that I would say is that, uh, me, because I work in loads of different industries, the game developers are a little bit slower and that's affecting their productivity a little bit. As soon as they get and ride this wave of being able to change their mindset and their thinking about how they do stuff, they're going to create stuff a lot faster and get to market a lot quicker. And, you know, and just going back to what Tommy said, there are a variety of different things that can be done from e-commerce to marketing, um, from um, monetization to uh, AI techniques within game development itself so we just gotta we've got to be at the bleeding edge of the technology or we're going to get left behind because people are just going to go to different places they're going to go to ar they're going to go to vr and traditional gaming is going to be left behind so we can't do that tommy do you want to go 
Uh, it's, I think it's always an int I think we're at this really interesting point. So this is going to be my uh, non-answer to this question is that I think we're at this really interesting phase where machine, this is the second time machine learning's had its swipe at the games industry um, for all intents and purposes. If we go back to the very late 90s, early 2000s, you have games like Black and White, uh, Creatures, um, the original Total War, all experimenting with this tech. And it didn't, it wasn't a proven commodity at this point. Uh, we didn't really know how to apply it, how to ensure consistency, how to ensure, and um, even where was the best places to apply it um, to improve the overall quality of the, of the product that's being generated. I think we're now at this really exciting phase where we're now beginning to understand the opportunities that lie within games and where now we can apply it. And I think it, it's, gonna, it's gonna come down to a couple of one or two big companies making taking a gamble and releasing something with these, with particular ML inspired implementations that's gonna really change everything. Uh, hard to sell what it is, um, particularly I'm looking again at that list of different uh, like uh, topic areas or focus areas that it can be applied. So I think we're, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna see something. I'm, I'm, I'm excited, I think I've got plenty of work to do. So I don't think I'm <laughs> gonna run out of anything to talk about in the coming years, but um, it's, but uh, I think certainly looking at some of the interesting stuff that comes out of academic research as well, we've now created this whole generation of PhD candidates who are also game developers. They're all now indie game devs because they have access to the tools. The democratization of game technology has changed this, that particular part of, of my, my world drastically. And I think now we're seeing so many more proofs of concept um, that could then later be taken and then fully adopted within a larger project. So. Yeah, don't know, but I'm super excited about it. Jeff or Jeffrey? I don't know if we're at yeah, Jeff no, yet. I'll <laughs> comment on like, just like how the trend, I just didn't like the like, how hardware and software frameworks are supporting like machine learning models. Um, I mean, if you think about most apps, like you go to like, like in the US we have Amazon, right? So you go to Amazon, you go to the product page and all the decisions of like what it should, you know, what pages should serve you. It's all like, you know, all the inferencing, all the decision really kind of happens on like a server side. Uh, in the gaming world, it's very it's very it's a much different problem. Like you're running a game at like let's say 30, 40, 50 FPS. You don't have like the latency like you need uh, to, to get a decision from machine learning cannot be like a server uh, client server based. The models you actually need to sit on the device, and you're starting to see more and more and more applications where you know the machine learning decisions need to happen on the device, not in a client server mm -hmm. in a model because the latency is just too high. And game is gaming is like the perfect example. Um, so what I, we see a lot of, I mean, we have our own inference engine, you know, so if you build a Unity game, we use, you know, your, we use like our own shader libraries and we, we basically have our own inference engine. Uh, but what happens is that we also integrate with some partners. So for example, if you want to run like a neural network on Apple iPhone, um, they have, uh, you know, Apple has like Core ML, which is their framework to run uh, machine learning models. And they, and they use like, they have a bunch of DSP chips that can be repurposed for, you know, machine learning inferencing. You see the same thing with uh, DirectML uh, at Windows. Um, DirectML also, they have, uh, they're using like the all DirectX stuff, right? And so it's all like the same map, but then you can use that to run machine learning models closer to the hardware. Because what happens again, if you can't, if you, if you need to wait, you're not even just waiting for a machine to make a decision, but if you're like uh, in places where there isn't a lot of interconnectivity or you're going under a tunnel, more and more, and this is even happening in the advertising space. Like you're actually putting more and more of the, decisions and machine learning models onto the device itself um, for privacy reasons, for latency reasons. Um, so you, again, we, we see it because obviously we're unity. So we have to, we partner with the, all the different you know, platforms. So we're starting to see like the Apples, the, you know, the Android, you know, the Googles of the world, the, you know, the, the Qualcomm's like Intel's, all of them are creating, like basically saying, okay, we recognize that there's gonna be a shift where machine learning models are moved to the device. And we need to support, you know, either from a software framework per second, but also like the physical hardware. And you see that with, I think every A in Apple, every A10 Bionic chip and above now has DSP chips that can be used for machine learning, which is, um, I mean, you see that trend and it's going to just increase. Uh, I don't I'm curious to see the next generation console that does it. Because I don't know if like, mm -hmm. if I'm not a console expert, but I'm curious to like, when Nintendo will have like some sort of machine learning. Nintendo is going to do it first. PS. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure they all have that in their road. They'll just fake it. They'll just fake it. Yeah, yeah you know yeah. Nintendo, they'll have some weird version of it, some massive alternative thing that nobody even thought of. But, um, yeah, exactly. 
So when it comes to mobile, what do you think uh, mobile space will benefit most from machine learning, especially over the next few years? Uh, probably from user acquisition, I would say. It's like a massive driver. Um, having worked in that mobile space is one of the things that we really just can't, um, as a game developer, we just can't get over. User acquisition is really important and we've also got to be able to ensure the safety of everybody that's playing the games. It's really difficult because we've got no control over it. But I think that, um, you know, if I use that analogy that I used earlier about the gold farmer and the safe breaker, we've got an opportunity to learn from our users and be able to create those um, digital or virtual spaces and learning experiences for us both as humans and for our AI and machine learning systems. So we actually can easily learn from everything that's already out there and be able to create our own realities within mobile technologies. Anyone else would like to add anything? I think that just, I think actually Kelly just kind of summed it up. I think the other <laughs> thing that goes with it though is also what Jeffrey was saying prior to that is the fact that we're now actually running more of these models, particularly trained machine learning models on the device. And that is also going to provide all these new opportunities to, you know, potentially for procedural content generation, for game balancing, toxicity purposes, the ability to quickly make these decisions for us um, without running on, without dealing with the network latency issues, without having to crunch the numbers really hard. If you have that model, then all it takes is just downloading the latest version of that model onto the device. Um, so you could actually see like significant um, improvements to existing functionality we have in games. Um, reducing the, the, the CPU time, but also just minimizing the network overhead as well. Yeah. And there was I agree answer. with Chloe and, yeah, and Tommy on that. They hit it on, hit it on the head. Yeah, that's cool then. I think that's uh, everything I've got for my questions because we are running out of time, unfortunately. I know we could discuss this all day, but we have got um, one question from an anonymous attendee in the chat, uh, just asking, uh, can entry level indie developers with low budgets make use of machine learning? Obviously, we touched upon beginner tools, stuff like that. But is there anything specific about indies that you'd recommend, or is it literally like go to Unity? Literally go to Unity. Unity has always been like the place where you can go, no matter what level of developer you are. I mean, I don't want to blow smoke up Jeffrey's ass, but I will do all night. <laughs> but, um, but truthfully, like that is the place that you go to if you're a student or you're kind of an entry level developer, because they provide so much. And they can do so much and they're really challenging like a lot of areas and they're doing it in a really sort of cost effective way for people that are at an entry level or want to break into the industry like no doubt and also open source you know open source kit is really important as well don't go for the ipad pro lidar go and do the cut and paste stuff in github instead first it's really important um if you want to get into ar vr etc Really just explore what open source can do for you, but know that Unity is probably your friend. And, Sorry, you know, Jackie. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, Unity, we're, we're biased, but um, yeah, I'll give you, I'll also like add on to that. Um, yeah, I mean, our MLA just told you all open source. Like we, we, we open source a lot of our machine learning and stuff because we, you know, we realize it, 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 it increases our ecosystem. It's, it's right for our customers, which happen to be a lot of indie in the market. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of end it with this is that, you know, if you look at like DeepMind and they, they solve StarCraft, right? And you look at OpenAI, they solve like Dota 2. What you don't see behind it is the, is the price tag. I think something with DeepMind mm -hmm. software, and we did back with mobile app. This is just something we did. I mean, you're, you're talking like tens of millions of dollars in, in training costs and time to solve like some of the hardest games. Now, we always think about that as like, that's not practical for actually most studios, not even like, you know, like research, but like even like probably the, you know, like the, the bungees of the world that with big budgets. I mean, these are like not um, practical solutions. So what we think about is like, if you use something like ML agents, we provide like things like sample efficient algorithms. So you don't need a lot of training time. We provide, you know, scale and distribution, you know, like, uh, you know, um, abilities with, you know, with all of our tools. Like we will allow you to run Unity Engine to, to in a way where you can get training data really quickly because we realize that like most studios don't have like, 10 to 15 million dollars to create a machine learning system that could test games or, or can build MVC. So for us, it's a very, I love this question because it always comes up. It's like, I get what you're saying, but I don't have either the expertise or costs. For us at Unity, um, and this is my, 
my only public announcement for, for Unity is that we, we try very hard <laughs> to make open source, implement things in ML agents that are, you know, very sample efficient, very, you know, like reduce training time, reduce training costs, um, because we recognize our customers as, are just, are, that have these kind of profiles. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey, we did it for you. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, really sincerely appreciate that. Yeah, anything else, Tommy, just to take us on? Yeah, I mean, Jeffrey kind of summed up like what my key point was that we really, like we said, like when people are looking at um, training machine learning algorithms, everyone's looking at the big fellas. We're just looking at what OpenAI or Google are doing. Now, I actually made at some point in an episode, I actually sat down and calculated this. Um, one of the more recent versions of AlphaStar would have been estimated to have probably spent $3.2 million training on TPUs as part of Google's infrastructure. Now, you've got to pay, you've got to keep in mind, that's them training to create the best, uh, one of the best um, StarCraft II players in the known world. Um, it's one of the highest ranking players of all time. What a lot of us are trying to do, and myself included, I'm trying to create a little small agent that can solve maybe one specific problem in a larger context of a game. I want a character that knows how to move around an environment and maybe not bump into walls. I want to make sure it can kind of aim at a player, but doesn't have godlike accuracy. Uh, like these are the sorts of problems that we are dealing with. And certainly, you know, I think with the Unity ML Toolkit, you can train these in a reasonable amount of time. You're not going to be sitting there like uh, setting a laptop on fire for two weeks. Um, we've actually improved those tools significantly. I went through several laptops back in the day, training machine learning agents to solve things in games. Thankfully, the tools have got better. Um, my laptop sadly can't speak to that. But yeah, it is possible. You're, you're, as long as you're not trying to create something godlike like AlphaStar, then you're fine. There we go. Oh, thank you very much for you all taking time out of your busy schedules to come and talk to us. Um, unfortunately, uh, we haven't got any more time to answer uh, any more questions, but I'm sure can everybody contact you? Uh, Tommy, what's the best way for people to contact you? Are you on Twitter? Obviously, YouTube? Yep, I'm, uh, everything, uh, YouTube and Twitter, uh, AI and Games. Um, you can also find me at AIandGames.com where you find a lot of the written versions of the stuff that I'm doing and also some of the projects with companies that I've been working on. Cool. What, what's your YouTube channel called? AI and games. There you AI go. and yeah. games. That's what. It, well, it's on your T-shirt, of course. Yeah. There, there you go. go. Subscribe, One like, brand. ring that uh, book, uh, bell, and everything. Yeah. Not uh, today. Je we're on another platform. So. All right. Uh, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> Say no more. Jeffrey, uh, can people find you? Yeah, absolutely. Like it's just my first name at Unity uh, Unity Three D dot com. Um, you know, uh, Twitter, Facebook, um, or you know, LinkedIn. You know, everything basically except my like probably home address and phone number. Uh, <laughs> That's fair enough. You're allowed that, I think. Yeah. Uh, Kelly? Electric Geisha, Twitter. You can follow me there and you can reach out to me on LinkedIn and you can email me kelly at soreal.ch. There you go. And I'm uh, obviously at pocketgamer.biz and you can find me at 4999 on Twitter. Um, so, yeah, thank you again for everybody attending. Uh, thank you again to my panelists, and uh, we'll be handing it back over to our main man, Dave Bradley. Thank Thanks, you very man. much, folks. Thank you. Yes, Jeffrey, Kelly, Tommy, and Matthew. What a great panel to end the day, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I've had my mind blown this afternoon by so many great talks. Uh, we've done machine learning. We've had AR, VR. We've spoken about uh, UX and UI. We've covered uh, CG and the development of CG in, in, in uh in, in the uh, movie theaters and much, much more. What a great few hours we've had here. And I really appreciate everyone taking time out to, to be part of it. But that does bring us to the end of today's talks and panels.